Hello, my name is Kelly Jolly. I am an ukulele player and storyteller. And I am at the birthplace of Country Music Museum in Bristol. Old time and country music have been influenced over the years by a variety of musical genres and styles, cultural traditions, instruments, and musicians. Despite this, country music is often viewed as music made by white musicians for white listeners. This goes back to the way that music was marketed in the recording industry. In the early 1900s, early commercial country music was called hillbilly music, and early blues music was labeled race records. It was presumed that hillbilly music was made by white rural musicians and marketed to white audiences, while race records were made by black musicians and marketed to black audiences. Even though this segregation of sound in marketing existed, there were black string bands and country blues musicians performing and recording at this time. We just don't hear about those in history as much. However, there are black musicians and scholars like Rhiannon Giddens and Don Flemons, previously of the string band Carolina Chocolate Drops, who are working hard to tell those stories today. So let's learn about some of those early musicians. At the 1927 Bristol Sessions, black musician L. Watson recorded two songs that were marketed as race records. At these sessions, he played the bones on a couple of songs recorded by the Johnson Brothers, a white duo, and Charles Johnson played the guitar on Watson's recordings. In other words, these are some of the earliest country and country blues recordings of white and black musicians playing together. Producer Ralph Peer was so impressed by Watson's musical skill that he invited Watson to New York in 1928 to record four more songs. At the 1928 Bristol Sessions, Stephen Tarter and Harry Gay recorded two songs. This act was influenced by ragtime and string music. They often performed on guitar and mandolin at both black and white dances and community events. The Tennessee Chocolate Drops, made up of brothers Howard and Roland Armstrong and Carl Martin, was a black string band that recorded at the Knoxville Sessions in 1930. Leslie Riddle is another important black musician who worked closely with the Carter family, known as the first family of country music. Born in North Carolina, Riddle later lived in Kingsport, Tennessee, where he first met A.P. Carter. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, Riddle traveled around the Appalachian South with Carter, and they spent their time song catching. They would go to factories, old country churches, community gatherings, and people's houses to learn new songs together. Then they would take those songs home back to the Carter's homestead where they would work them up into recordable hits. Think about the challenges they must have faced in the Jim Crow South. Hotels and restaurants who wouldn't serve or provide bed to Riddle because of his race. And they may have even encountered hostility from some other white folks because they were working together. Riddle also influenced Maybelle Carter, who created her renowned Carter Scratch by emulating and further developing his unique playing technique. He later moved to Rochester, New York, giving up music for many years. However, in the 1970s, Riddle began playing again in small music venues in the area where he met Mike Seeger, who recorded him and helped him to release a CD based around his time working with the Carters. Another important early black musician was D. Ford Bailey, the first African-American artist to perform on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville in the 1920s. He came from a musical family that played what he called black hillbilly music. In other words, string band and country blues type music. He was a multi-instrumentalist but he was best known as the harmonica wizard for his skills on that instrument. One of his most famous harmonica pieces on the Grand Old Opry was the Pan American Blues, which recreated the evocative sounds of a locomotive. He sounded like a train. Bailey recorded for various labels and performed live throughout the South and Midwest during his musical career, often facing the difficulties and indignities of the Jim Crow South on his musical tours. Elizabeth Cotton, 
whose musical skills and style was based on the black instrumental traditions, played guitar and banjo, and wrote her best known song, Freight Train, at the age of 12. After giving up music for many years to raise a family, Cotton started playing again and performing on stage later in life, winning a Grammy at age 90. Her music has been hugely influential on black and white roots and traditional musicians. The musicians I've shared with you are just only a few of the early black musicians whose music is part of the rich and diverse history of old time and country music. Since then, many others have carried on these sounds and made their own mark within the genre. For instance, Charlie Pride was a Negro League professional baseball player who rose to fame as a country musician in the late 1960s and 70s. He is one of the only three black members of the Grand Ole Opry. In 1969, Linda Martell became the first black female country music singer to appear on the Grand Ole Opry. Darius Rucker, once the lead singer of rock band Hootie and the Blowfish, is now one of the most popular country stars in Nashville. In 2009, he became the first black American to win the New Artist Award from the Country Music Association. Country music songwriter Alice Randall was the first black woman to write a number one country hit, X's and O's, An American Girl, released by Trisha Yearwood in 1994. A few years ago, Lil Nas X's crossover song, Old Town Road, led to debate about what is and is not country music when it was controversially removed from the Billboard country music charts for not being country enough. Finally, organizations like the Black Opry in Nashville are providing stages, support, and promotion for black artists underlining and celebrating their place and impact on country music. Thank you.